Edge Dwellers Cafe is a regularly irregular, long-form, interview-based podcast featuring conversations about politics, environment, and mental health in a world on edge. I'm your host, Ben Habib, international relations academic, environmental educator, and neurodiversity advocate who likes having a chat over a hot coffee. My caffeinated conversations try to make sense of the different kind of edges that define us, divide us, and shape how we interact with each other in a world that's under stress, and what it means to be a little different. Greetings, Edge Dwellers. Anyone who's familiar with North Korea is aware of the reprehensible human rights record of the North Korean government and the dire humanitarian situation endured by a sizable portion of the North Korean population. Yet figuring out what to do about this catastrophe is both complicated logistically and it's politically contested. To tease out some of the important issues related to humanitarian aid in North Korea, I'm joined in this episode by Dr. Nazanin Zadeh Cummings. Lecturer in Humanitarian Studies at the Centre for Humanitarian Leadership at Deakin University here in Melbourne. Nazanin has research interests in disaster management, humanitarian aid and access, human rights and civil society, with a particular focus on topics that engage with humanitarian sector practitioners. In this conversation, we discuss the humanitarian sector and humanitarian aid in North Korea along with transitional justice for a post-Kim DPRK, and we also reflect humorously and lovingly on the North Korean studies community. We muse on living in Melbourne versus Hong Kong and Seoul, and we talk about mental health in academia and what it means to own your own mental health demons. Like myself, Nazanin is a member of the vibrant Korean studies academic community that we have here in Melbourne, and I'd like to send a shout out to everyone in this network. All of our work is enriched by being part of this local community of scholars. But before we settle in with Nazanin for a chat and a hot herbal tea, a quick call to arms. Don't forget to support the EDC by clicking like or subscribe on your preferred listening platform and leave a review if you're feeling motivated. Let's get those algorithms churning to get the podcast out there to more edge dwellers. You can also help support the production of the podcast by shouting a coffee for the EDC via the Edge Dwellers Cafe page on Ko-Fi. Now, I'm not after big-time philanthropy, just a few dollars to help offset the cost of researching, hosting, editing, and for equipment for the podcast. You can find the link to the Ko-Fi page in the show notes and also on the podcast homepage. Now, without any further delay or deliberation, Let's kick back with my conversation with Nazanin Zadeh Cummings. The Edge Dwellers Cafe. Nazanin, welcome to the Edge Dwellers Cafe. Thank you for having me. So like all good IR and international development researchers and people in the humanitarian sector, you've had a fascinating path to get where you are now. Tell us about that journey. How did you get from where you started to your professional position now? Sure. So I started in Massachusetts. I am born and raised in Massachusetts. I grew up about an hour outside of Boston, but I always had quite an international lens to my life because my parents are both immigrants to the U.S. Um, My mom is from Bolivia and my dad is from Iran. So from a very young age, my world was bigger than Massachusetts And so I think that really influenced a lot of the choices and interests that I developed, particularly going into becoming a teenager. And I did an international relations degree for my undergrad. I think like many IR undergrads with this idea of I'm going to work for the UN and save the world. (laughs) Um, And after that, I moved to Hong Kong to teach English for a year. Seemed like something interesting to do, something fun to do. And I had never been to Hong Kong, but I actually have an aunt that has traveled more than anyone I know. And I asked her once what her favorite place was, and she said Hong Kong. And I thought, all right, oh my God, I got to check this place out. So I went for a year to teach English, and that experience taught me a few things. One was that I like teaching, but not English. I don't have 
a deep love of the English language or, yeah, the kind of, I think, intellectual curiosity about language learning and language acquisition that one needs to be an effective English teacher as a career. Um, but I realized I did like teaching, but just not the content I was teaching. And I also kind of was thinking, oh, I miss uni. <laughs> this work thing is uh, not exactly, I mean, I, I enjoyed it. And it was a very low stakes job in the sense that it was, I didn't have, I never worked overtime. It was, it was a lot of fun, but it did get me kind of thinking that I was missing studying. Because when I finished my undergrad, I had no intentions of moving forward in study or no, yeah, I, I didn't assume that I would go forward. I never thought I would get a PhD. Um, but then I decided I wanted to go back and study. And I had always been interested in and involved in human rights activism. And that was actually kind of my gateway to the humanitarian sphere was I was interested in human rights, um, but was thinking also kind of more broadly around showing solidarity and responding to suffering. And that kind of led me to be interested in the humanitarian world. So I did a master's in humanitarian studies, again, with no intention of any further study. <laughs> but it was in that master's that really had to think, break down some of my own kind of white savior assumptions that I had thought, great, I'll get this master's and I'm going to go and, you know, I'll go off somewhere with a one way ticket and find a job and have a great life. But then really being confronted quite late, I think, you know, this is when I was in my early 20s, I probably should have been thinking about the, aware of this much earlier, um, and thinking critically about this much earlier, I uh, was thinking, well, what do I have to offer? Like, why, you know, I did get a piece of advice once that was like, oh, buy a one way ticket to Nairobi and see what you could find, which I did not do. Um, and I remember thinking, but what, what do I have to offer? I don't actually don't know anything about Nairobi. I don't know anything about like what, what could I do that someone that's already there couldn't do? Like, what would I be bringing? Um, and that's actually what led me into research. I knew I liked reading. I knew I liked learning. I was interested in research, but I hadn't done any on my own yet. And then in my master's, I had the opportunity to go to Indonesia for six months to do my own research. Um, I did a project on how humanitarians understand and deal with death. Um, because I was interested in this field that is all about reducing morbidity and mortality, what happens when we can't reduce it. And I was uh, particularly focusing on the eruption of Mount Merapi because I was based in Jakarta, uh, and also a little bit on the Aceh uh, Indian Ocean tsunami. And that was when I was like, I think this is what I can offer. I think this is the skill I have. This is the skill I can build. Um, this is what I want to develop. And that's how I decided to do a PhD. I did my PhD, I went back to Hong Kong to do my PhD at the City University of Hong Kong in an Asian and international studies department. Then when I was about to finish, was looking for a job. I think like many, many people in their early stages of their academic career know that that phase and that feeling of what, what now? And I was really open to going anywhere in the world. I felt like I had to cast a wide net because the market is so challenging. And I also was privileged that I could cast a wide net that I didn't have things tying me to a particular place. And so I got this job. And I remember at the time Googling what it's like to live in Melbourne. And Melbourne was the world's most livable city. So I thought, all right, I'll give it a go. Can't be that bad. <laughs> um, and that was three and a half years ago. And so I've been a lecturer at Deakin since August 2018. So three and a half years. And I'm in one of the few humanitarian studies areas in the world, um, the only dedicated one in Australia, um, though there are other people working on humanitarian issues all around the country, and there are, I think, adjacent and relevant fields. But so it was exactly the kind of job I was looking for. So I got, in many ways, I got very lucky that this was open when I was applying. Yes, I worked hard and all that, but it was also an element of just chance and luck. And that's how I'm sitting here today. It was funny when you were talking about teaching English. I hadn't had exactly the same experience when I went to Dandong and taught English there for mm -hmm. a while and realized, yeah, I like teaching, but I don't like teaching English. I have memories of teaching, trying to teach three-year-old kids in an upstairs dance studio with wooden floors, mirrored walls, and they're all screaming while I'm trying to hold up flashcards. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, I prefer the uni-age students. Actually, that's when I figured out I like the uni-age mm -hmm. students the best. I resonated with them the most. But that is an aside. Is it true that Melbourne is the most livable city in the world? So we both didn't grow up in Melbourne, so we've got some kind of objectivity here. I'm interested in what you think about that. 
I think livable is such a personal barometer that it's hard to make these sweeping judgments. I found a lot of challenges to adjusting to life in Melbourne. Particularly, I was used to life in Hong Kong where there's people everywhere. And I was also used to going out at any hour by myself and not having any ever thinking twice about safety. And I think in general, Melbourne is a very safe city. But, you know, I used to go for runs by myself at like midnight um, that I with headphones on and there would be other people also running at midnight in Hong Kong with headphones on. And, you know, so that was a big adjustment. And I often felt quite I, I would get quite nervous. Uh, actually, my first few years here looking around and not seeing people on the street, I'd be like, where is everyone? Um, and then we went into COVID and that was a whole other question of where where is everyone? You know, you don't want to see that many people on the street. Um, so in that sense, it. it For me personally, it was, that was a huge adjustment to get used to this different style of city where it's more spread out and it's still quite dense for Australia. And I live in an apartment building, which I really like. So I I recognize that there are places that are much more spread out. So for me, that was not livable, inherently livable. That, That was an adjustment I had to make. But in many ways, I think Melbourne is just an incredible place to live. We have so much great culture, food things to do, places to go, public transport is pretty decent. So I think it is very, very livable. And I've enjoyed living here. And I think in COVID in my five kilometers, I fell in love with these five kilometers, my little radius, I think is the most livable five kilometers in the world. But again, that's quite subjective. That's for me. Uh, The air here tastes like candy. When I first moved from Hong Kong, I would just walk down the street and just breathe in and be like, oh, this is, this is luxurious. So in many ways it is ultra livable, but I do think, you know, different people have different expectations for a, a, a place. And I'm sure if people love the rural life, Melbourne will not also be very livable to them. So yeah, I, th- I think it's quite subjective. Yeah. Coming from Hong Kong to Melbourne, the lack of people, I think that's, it's a very noticeable thing, isn't it? When you spend time in East Asia, highly populated places and you come back here. I always had reverse culture shock when I came back from Uh, in Korea or China. And that was one of the big reasons, just where's the people? Where's the sensory assault of being in other places uh, that you just don't get in Australia? But I I agree. I think Melbourne's a great city to live in. It's very cosmopolitan. There's nowhere like it in Australia and probably nowhere like it in the world either. Yeah, I would agree with that. If I I can add maybe one more thing about the differences between, I think, also places like Korea – and Melbourne that was an adjustment was the the ratio of private, the amount of your life you live in private and public. In Hong Kong, we had very small apartments. I know it's also common in, in, particularly in in Seoul to not have a lot of space. Um, So there's a huge cafe culture. And I know Melbourne has a big cafe culture, but if it's a different style of cafe culture, where I lived in Hong Kong, there were cafes that would be open very late at night. So if I wanted to just read a book after dinner, I would go to the cafe alone and read in the cafe because I didn't have space for a comfortable chair in my apartment. It was a very small, small space. You know, people don't have private vehicles. Everything is done in public. And so that was also a very big adjustment. And then in COVID, obviously living so much of our lives in private. And it's one I I think about a lot. I mean, I think in other ways, Australians are very kind of public minded. So I, I don't mean to say that everyone here is that everything is ultra privatized and people are ultra home base. I don't necessarily think that's true, but that was another kind of adjustment of what I do at home versus what I do in public was a big change. And I think, you know, doing fieldwork in Korea, you might have experienced something similar, the amount of time you spent out versus in. Yeah. Yeah. And when you're not used to that sort of communitarian culture and coming from Australia, because at the time when I first went to Korea, I was living in Adelaide. I grew up in Mount Gambier in a smaller town. That was a massive leap to go from Adelaide to Seoul. Melbourne to Seoul is not quite as big a jump, but there are there are significant cultural differences there. I didn't mean to end up doing a tourism plug for Melbourne, but there, <laughs> there you go. I liked what you said about wanting to save the world when you're an undergrad. I remember that too. It was in maybe the first tutorial in my undergrad when I started studying international relations and the icebreaker activity is what do you want to do with your career? And people were going around and you know, saying very mundane things. And I said, I want to become an activist and save the world. And big round of applause. And, of course, I look back and back and think, yeah, nah, that's a bad <laughs> place to start. There's all of that white saviorism, 
it's, it's a very colonial mindset that underpins wanting to be the saviour, even if it comes from a place of wanting to do good. And that, I guess that's a really big issue for people moving into the humanitarian sector. Yeah, so I think there's a few things here. Um, I think first there are, I'm going to recall an article written by R.B. Bagios, who's now a PhD candidate at LSE. He's a humanitarian professional, um, worked in the sector before moving into academia, and wrote on this website called Aid Reimagined that he founded. And one of his articles that I really love and I said is required reading for my students is about how the structures and the underpinning of aid of the humanitarian aid system is colonial, but that altruism is not. And so to remind ourselves of that underlying compassion and altruism and care for one another. So when I hear students say things like, I want to save the world, or I think about my own kind of aspirations of saving the world, I think Yes, there is absolutely that part of why you, what can you do to save the world? Why do you think that you are able to go in to a place that you have no connection to and save it? So I think there's that side of it, but then there's also the side of, well, what is underpinning that? Why do you want to save their world? Is it a care for others? Is it this belief in humanity? Is it a love of people? And I think connecting with that and thinking, well, then how can I channel that into more just and equitable ways of support? rather than ways of support that maybe seem supportive, but are actually perpetuating power imbalances or perpetuating my privilege over others. So I don't think, you know, if someone, if particularly if a, an undergraduate student ever listens to this and thinks, but I want to save the world, like, oh, no, um, I think there, that's not something to, to then just assume, well, I have to throw out that idea. I think it's really worth unraveling that and seeing, well, what's at the core of this? What do I what what beliefs do I hold that make me want to help people? And then thinking about, well, what communities am I a part of that I can tap into for that? And I think that was a big learning for me was this assumption that my, my master's degree is called international humanitarian action. So there's this assumption that, oh, no, this doesn't happen here. This is international. And I think it's really important no matter where someone is from. But I'm going to think particularly from the mindset of someone living here, it's important to think about, well, how can I show humanitarianism and how can I show compassion within my own community? And unfortunately, Australia has no shortage of humanitarian crises, disasters, as I'm sure many people listening will have experienced themselves, horrific policies toward refugees. I, you know, COVID was itself another kind of humanitarian crisis. And so I think this idea of I want to save the world, well, what else can you do? You know, what can you do closer to home? And that doesn't also necessarily mean home as a, as a place. I think also as um, particularly young people, which now that I've said that out loud makes me sound really old, um, but, you know, particularly people that have, have spent a lot of time living their life online or spent a lot of their lives online that they may have, you know, communities online, transnational online communities that are not place-based, but are still a community, you know, how can we support, you know, these different types of communities that we're a part of? So yeah, I, I don't necessarily think it's a knee-jerk reaction to hear someone say that, to say, I want to save the world. Think, oh no, you know, that's a horrible thing to say. I think unpacking a little bit and going more to the foundations of that, which for me is a love of people. I think people are really great and really cool and really interesting. And I think everyone should be able to live the life they want to live and experience the world that they can to the fullest. Even though a lot of humanitarianism is about quite um, foundational needs, for me, there's always that kind of underpinning of, well, I hope that this can lead to, to flourishing and, you know, not only just responding to suffering, but enabling people to maybe enabling again is kind of a power laden word, but yeah, supporting people and being able to live, lead the life they want to live. So for some people, it will be a faith-based reason. For some people, it will be secular. For some people, it will be changing as their life moves on. They may initially start with this belief in humanity and then, you know, evolve into something else. But I think, yeah, the underpinning ideas behind why people want to save the world, I think are really important. And can help us unpack and unravel some of that more power-laden negative aspects of white saviorism. 
So some deep critical self-reflection and narrowing your horizon of what you're actually capable of doing. Exactly. So you talked about finding your niche as a researcher, that that's, that's your big contribution in the humanitarian field. What's the relationship between research and practice in the humanitarian sector? How would you describe that? Well, it's, it's a network of relationships. It's not just us. The most simple way is, oh, well, good research should inform good practice, but I think it's much more complex than that. I think there's the relationship between research and policy, which informs practice, which I think is really important. And something that I'm trying to upskill in is my ability to have uh, more of a policy impact and more of policy focused conversations. Because most of my work focuses on North Korea, where there is, you know, the sanctions regime, where there are restrictions by home countries that influence whether what non-state actors are able to do. And this is talking pre-COVID, but also once the borders do open, you know, these, these policies impact what humanitarian practice can look like. And so I think there's that relationship between well, how does research play an advocacy role in encouraging stakeholders with power, encouraging governments, encouraging donors to make choices that support effective humanitarian work and that support good outcomes for North Koreans. So I think that's a really important aspect of the relationship. For me, sometimes I've had this, this feeling of, you know, I interview a lot of humanitarian workers and sometimes I feel a little like, oh, I'm just an academic. I told someone recently that worked in the humanitarian sector and they said, oh, you also work in the sector. And I was like, yeah, but I have like a job that could give me a carpal tunnel. Like I'm not out there, you know, actually doing anything. I'm, you know, I'm a carpal tunnel humanitarian. And their response to that was, yeah, but we need, you know, the synthesis that you, we don't have time in our day-to-day -day lives to be doing some of that synthesis and some of the analysis and some of the big picture thinking that you have the space to do. And so I think there's really this symbiosis in that, um, you know, research can provide and researchers can provide that sometimes that outside perspective that can be really, really valuable. Sometimes it is, you know, researchers that have moved from practice that bring a little bit of that inside knowledge as well that can be really valuable. So I think that research can inform better practice in the sense of, you know, yes, what, what works? What do we see evidence of? How do we understand the impact of the work of humanitarian practice? How do we understand how humanitarian response both negatively and positively impacts communities, the long-term impacts. But I think there's also the importance of policy and of, of space. And as we talked about earlier, reflection, um, I think academia gives a really great outlet for reflecting on humanitarian aid. And because it um, ideally and theoretically should be independent, you know, it, we're not telling a donor what they want to hear there is, I think, a little bit more latitude for some critique and some reflection. I mean, that being said, of course, there is lots of critique and reflection from within the sector as well. I don't want that to be misunderstood, but I think academia provides a different avenue for some of that reflection. What do you think are the most significant issues in the humanitarian sector in 2022? Obviously, the world's in an interesting place, let's say. What is on your radar? So I think it's important to remember the humanitarian sector is embedded within a wider political, economic, and social context. So I think one of the big issues that the sector is facing is the lack of funding, that even if absolute funding volumes increase, the gap between what's needed and what is funded is widening, and we're seeing needs increase. But I, I think phrasing it that way is needs increase is quite deceptive. Because why are needs increasing? Well, it's because of political, economic decisions that are being made. And so it's not a simple matter of, well, great, if suddenly the tides turned and all of the funding that was needed was given, that wouldn't really solve the problem either. I think we can remember Elon Musk talking about solving world hunger and the WFP saying, well, you can, you know, give all of, you can solve all of our funding problems for this year, but that still wouldn't be solving hunger. You know, these are structural issues. And particularly as I think COVID, we move into a new era of COVID where inequalities between populations that have access to vaccines and have access to pharmaceuticals will grow. And I think this is something that we're watching in North Korea. You know, here I've been very easily able to get my three shots. And so for me, life has 
in many ways return to normal. But I think it's naive to say that that's happening worldwide. And it's important to remember that. So yeah, I, I think the, the funding gaps are a major issue, but keeping in mind what they're embedded within these wider political and social and economic structures. And I think one thing that goes along with that is climate change, the impacts of climate change and the ability to know when disaster may be coming. So I really, do, I don't use the term natural disaster in any of my courses or in any of my writing. Uh, and this is in for, I'll give a, if I can, a plug to another potty. The Disasters Deconstructed podcast is a fabulous podcast all about disasters. And I think if people are interested in disasters, it's a really, really great way to learn a little bit more about the field. Um, but this idea that disasters are, are natural removes the human decision-making element. I heard a quote once that was, uh, earthquakes don't kill people, buildings do. And I think that kind of echoes the wider issues in the sector. Funding won't solve problems, structural change will. So much of humanitarian response is reactive. It's challenging to get funding for anticipatory preventative work. It's challenging to tell a story of how preventative work works because you kind of don't know if it's worked. If, if nothing happens, that means it's been a success. And how do you measure that? Um, and how do you measure that for, for the donor? So a lot of my concerns are built around funding, but they're not, um, again, I, I don't think that actually achieving a hundred percent funding will actually solve problems. Um, it will make things a little bit easier, but those structural underpinnings will remain. And I'm talking where, what am I talking about when I'm talking about funding? I'm talking about, um, the funding that I track and follow that's, uh, organized by channel through the UN system through UNOCHA, um, financial tracking service. FTS is one of my most visited websites to see how much are things being, but these, this is only a certain type of humanitarian action. This is humanitarian work that's channeled through the international system and not enough of this goes to local actors. So also what's missing from this data is, well, how are local responders equipped or not equipped to be able to deal with the problems they're seeing? Are they able to access solutions to these problems? And this, I think, speaks to the kind of colonial structures of the humanitarian system. Uh, you know, who is leading the, the decision making? Who is leading the understanding of what needs to be done? So I think there's a lot of a lot of problems and a lot of issues facing the sector, both this year and next year and for the foreseeable future. That issue of localization of humanitarian aid delivery, that's really interesting. So what are the pros and cons of devolving decision-making and responsibility to the local level? I'm going to be a little, I'm going to test out some thoughts that I have here. Let's see how they, see how they go. <laughs> um, I think in some ways, North Korea is the most localized humanitarian response because you can't, can't do, unless you do kind of, smuggling type things or illicit things, but anything that's on the ground, you know, above board needs to be done with the approval and working with North Korean counterparts. You can't do things without North Korean perspectives having a significant impact on a program. For many people, or for, for maybe for the sector more widely, localization means devolving to the local when the local looks like us, when the local is structured the way we have political structures. So we expect to see civil society. Um, we expect to see a democratic government. We expect to see things structured in a way that is familiar. And when I say us, I mean, you know, people like myself that are living in countries like this, that have civil society, that have democratic government. And so I think a, a context like North Korea really pokes at what does the sector mean by localization? Because here's an ultra localized response, but a lot of people don't like that either. And so I think there are some assumptions underpinning localization that I don't see talked about enough. And I want to be clear, like I hope that North Koreans will one day be able to experience civil society and form civil society. And um, I don't mean to say that, you know, democracy or civil society are bad, but I think what I'm getting at is that I think localization makes assumptions about what kind of local is valid to be localized. 
and what kind are not. And of course, this also goes into questions of, well, you know, is working with an authoritarian regime, is that supporting it? Is that under, and that's you know, a major critique of, of humanitarian aid. So I, I think actually localization, I found to be in some ways quite colonial in that it is, it's supporting a certain type of local. That being said, I think there's many, many different ways for localization to look because the local is, is different in many, local means many things. Um, and that's one thing that I also sometimes find a little flat in some of the conversations about localization is, well, what, what does local look like in this context? You know, what are the structures, you know, what is the national, regional, provincial, you know, what, what are these kind of structures? How local, national doesn't equal local, but I find sometimes that they're used interchangeably, but they're, I don't think they are. And also recognizing that local local communities also have their own structures of power. And so I think localization can't ignore that communities will have marginalized people, communities will have their own structures of power. So I think sometimes I see this kind of romanticization of the local that, you know, and I think of this word community that it means people just living in, in this beautiful harmony. And of course I do support community building and local organizations and local structures having the power that they deserve, but also acknowledging that, yeah, this isn't some romantic utopia that local and community are not synonymous with equitable or just, but that's also part of what transferring that power means is, well, how do these communities understand justice? How do they understand what equitable and just would look like for them? And how can they find those paths? I think in many cases, you know, they have already. So I, I think it's 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 a very textured conversation, and I find it actually sometimes quite challenging to talk about these things globally because it's so different in so many different contexts. And I, I like the decolonization is another one that I think you know different. Like the colonial history in Australia is different from colonial histories elsewhere. And so when I think about decolonization, like for me, I find it really challenging to talk about decolonizing aid in Australia when. Like, isn't step one to give land back? Like, how can we have a decolonized aid system when we still have a colonized, like, daily structures are colonized? And the whole, so, you know, I, I think recognizing that, um, that's sometimes the, the consequence of talking globally. It's interesting that some practitioners would think of localization and have like one model to offer lots of different contexts about how this should take place when. Obviously, every community, every project is location-specific needs and challenges that would have to emerge organically from the ground up rather than being imposed from above. So the, the humanitarian sector in the last, I guess, 25 years has really undergone a lot of reform and work to become better coordinated and be in better dialogue across the sector and I think there's lots of benefits to that. And I think this is also in parallel with a lot of the dialogue around professionalizing the humanitarian sector, holding people to higher standards, having ideas around well, what kind of skills are needed in the sector and you know what kind of structures are needed so that organizations are actually speaking to one another. But I think the flip side to all that coordination is that it is very kind of top down. It is very structured and often with you know the UN taking the helm in this coordination and so, you know, who, who gets left out of those conversations? Um, how do we not lose the benefits of coordination while also not becoming so ultra focused on structures, even if they're structures that are meant to be good, that then, you know, if someone falls outside of those structures, then they lose their ability to be heard. They lose their ability to have voice within those, those structures. So I think with Many things, you know, there's there's the kind of flip side as well. So I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, this coordination system should be <laughs> destroyed. But I think, you know, when you said this bottom up, then I'm still saying, well, this kind of top down structures as well. And so how do we how do we ensure that the bottom up is being listened to while not being, I guess, suffocated by the top down? Yeah, and not romanticizing the grassroots efforts when knowledge and capacity and skills aren't there. So let's talk North Korea now. So you recently published a report with James Banfield, Jasmine Barrett, and Carlo Vitantonio called Opening Doors in North Korea. And something that caught my eye in particular was your call to foster international solidarity with the citizens of the DPRK. 
So that language of solidarity with is not particularly common in most discourses about Korea. So from your perspective, what does that solidarity mean? What does it look like? I love this question because I think this speaks to my wider interest in North Korea and why I'm interested in in North Korea and in North Koreans. So as I mentioned earlier, part of my journey into the humanitarian world was actually first being involved in human rights activism and not human rights activism to do with North Korea, but more general human rights activism, particularly anti-death penalty activism, um, which I'm still, I'm still involved with and still, I think, a a cause that I, I think about a lot. For me, I, I came into the sector with a, a bit of naivete around how human rights and humanitarian actors can view each other or be in dialogue with one another, or not be in dialogue with one another. And that was really hit home the first time I went to Seoul uh, on field work and you know seeing the divides between approaches. But I think what I, I constantly think about is well, but these are different ways of you know, the problem we have with North Korea is we can't just talk to average North Koreans. So there is, of course, the escapee community. There are, you know, outlets that publish from sources they have inside the country. There are, you know, it's not like a sealed black box, but it's not like other contexts. And I sometimes get a little jealous of people that do field work in countries that they just like fly in and go talk to people. I know, I know it's not that easy, um, but, you know, of course, it's North Korea, you can't do that. And so I think what I see as similar across, you know, whether it's talking about humanitarian response, whether it's talking about human rights, whether it's talking about English classes for North Korean refugees, which I think was happening in, in Sydney for a while, any, any things to do with the well-being of North Koreans, both inside and outside of the country, I see the, the underpinning of, of solidarity, that that's one of the common things across all. These approaches can be very different and can have very different ideas about what North Koreans need. But I think to me, it all goes back to solidarity. How do we express a care, compassion, and acknowledgement of the North Korean people when we cannot do it in a way that we can maybe do in other places? I, I think of um, a quote I heard, I think it was uh, from Ed Reed, who was a humanitarian worker with Mercy Corps, I believe, in the 90s. And he wrote, Uh, One day, will the North Korean farmers thank me for the work I did, or will they condemn me for the work I did? And that really kind of stuck in my mind. Um, And I found it really inspiring to hear such a humble reflection. And I think, again, this theme of reflection coming up, you know, that we just don't know what people will think. You know, we just don't know yet what, what North Koreans are really thinking and what their opinions. And of course, there won't be one singular opinion on oh, yes, the human rights approach was better. Yes, the humanitarian approach was better. Oh, no, both of these were wrong. The international community should have been doing this. But I think it's important to to center North Koreans in all of these dialogues and to center, well, how can transnational communities not aim to speak for North Koreans, not aim to assume that everything they're doing is is right or assume that this is the, the singular answer? It's important to, to, to center North Koreans and to think about North Koreans, which I think in some ways sounds really like obvious, like yeah, humanitarian, human rights, word human is writing there, shouldn't be thinking about humans. But I think it always bears remembering. And so to me, solidarity is a way of thinking about this transnational work that does center North Koreans and thinks, well, removing these labels of humanitarian human rights, whatever, what does this boil down to? And to, and to me, it's around solidarity and around the hope that North Koreans can have a future that is conducive to them being able to live these fulfilled, flourishing lives that I was kind of talking about earlier. Yeah, this is a very difficult group of people to centre, isn't it? Because like in some instances, you see North Korean people, quote unquote, can be used in the same way that unborn children or future generations can be used. So this amethyst group that doesn't really have a voice of its own. And so you can use that as a rhetorical marker for any kind of political position. But having said that, there are North Korean voices that can be accessed. 
But then the the biography of the people that do make it out of North Korea and can talk is a very is a very narrow sliver of the greater mass of North Korean people. So it's a, it's a very complicated question. What is the good strategies to centering North Korean voices? So I think there's a few. I think first is this plurality of voices that you know people will have different opinions. Um, and not assuming that one voice speaks for others, you know, this, the, the danger of the single story. I think there's also, I know there's this, this whole genre of defector literature, um, but there's also another genre that I'm finding really interesting right now about humanitarian workers that have written books about their experiences in North Korea. And many of these will feature interactions with North Koreans. Oftentimes the North Koreans' identities are not revealed, and they're often quite small little daily interactions. So it's not it's, it's not centering North Koreans in the sense that these are not books written by North Koreans, of course, and to be very clear on that, but that, you know, the way that a foreign aid worker, you know, works with their counterparts or the little rituals they have with a coworker, you know, things like that, that I find quite, quite interesting as well. So I think making sure, looking for where North Koreans, I find this question difficult. This is, well, maybe let me reframe. So you remember what Marcus Bell had to say about the defector literature on this podcast. When I, I know you listened to that. Yeah, yeah. I can't remember if you remember it. So from, from the perspective of his research, he talked about the pressures that come with being a celebrity voice mm-hmm. for someone who's written one of these famous memoirs. And it's okay, you've written your book, you've told your story, then what? Mm-hmm. And so that interaction with the defectors need to continue earning a living mixed with the US or South Korean media publication industry and the need for new content, new content, new content. What, where does that lead? Well, you know, there's this whole economy around escapees and, and defectors and some of the dialogue around North Korea from earlier years has improved because people now, you know, people that know nothing else about North Korea will maybe pick up a defector memoir or, you know, see a defector speak. Um, And I'm not talking about South Korean audiences. I'm I'm talking mainly about particularly American audiences, Australian audiences. You know, I I think there's that balance of, you know, encouraging, I think about, you know, conversations I'll have with other Australians, like encouraging people to, you know, listen to these voices and hear what defectors have to say, while also making sure that people don't fall like, oh, well, I read one defector memoir. So like, now I know what the defector experience is. Like, no, (laughs) North Koreans are, like all people, multifaceted, have different experiences. And and it seems so, again, so fundamental to, like, not fundamental, it seems so, like, obvious to say that sometimes. Like, oh, North Koreans are people, like, duh. (laughs) But I think it it still bears repeating just because of some of the ways um, North Korea can be talked about in a way that is quite reductive. You know, I had the honor for actually the the first time of of working with a defector uh, on a project that uh, Timothy Cho spoke. He did a a talk for a project I am working on with my colleague, Daniel Chubb and Sarah Son, who's based, Sarah, Daniel is at Deakin as well, and Sarah is in the UK. Um, And Timothy did a talk that ideally our plan when we got the the grant was that we'd bring the talk to be in person. But of course, you know, that didn't happen. So we did it on Zoom uh, and Timothy was joined with the Honorable Michael Kirby. And it was just amazing. And, you know, we had this choice when it went online of well, what what time do we do this at? Like, do we do this at a time when the U.S. will be able to watch? Because we know there will be lots of people interested there. Do we do it at the time Europe is able to watch? And Ultimately, we made the choice to do it at a time for Australians because we said, well, when we want to do this in person, part of the reason we wanted to do this was to give Australians an opportunity to hear what Timothy has to say. I feel like Australians don't always necessarily get, you know, those, these things happen maybe in in other places more than they happen here. And so we deliberately kind of did it at a time that was conducive to Australian audiences. And most of the people that came were Australian. And to me, that was really important to be able to facilitate this experience. And I hope that from that, people will then go on to learn more about North Korea. I think just, you know, in any other country, like if you meet, if you meet a Canadian afterwards, you're not like, well, I learned everything there is to know about Canada. (laughs) And so again, it seems sometimes very like obvious, like it's true that individuals and their stories are important. And it's true that 
a single story is not the danger of the single story. Um, I don't think that those are contradictory. Again, I think sometimes I ask myself things I hear about North Korea, things I think myself about North Korea. I don't want to say that I'm above this myself or beyond this myself. Like, what would I think if I put this in the context of another place? The Edge Dwellers Cafe. The Kim regime obviously contributes to the ongoing depredation of North Korean citizens, and clearly this is well known. But you've also argued that the international community gets in the way as well. What does the international community get wrong in its approach? Yeah, I think a few things. I did a project on sanctions impact on humanitarian aid that was published in 2020. It was interesting to see, you know, what what really is the experience for humanitarian actors trying to navigate the sanctions regimes. Um, Of course, there is humanitarian exemption, but even the threshold of being able to put paperwork in to get an exemption is quite high. And that was one thing I found, again, talking like these assumptions that are maybe built into some of these systems. The assumption is, well, you know, if you're a big NGO with a legal team, you can navigate a sanctions regime. But what if you're a small NGO? You know, there's many small NGOs that are are purpose-built to focus on North Korea that don't have giant legal teams at the ready. So I think, you know, one thing that came out of that work was the resource burden of the exemptions. And so I think thinking around, yes, humanitarian exemption, but then what, what does that, what burden does that exemption put on these organizations? And how can these exemptions be done in a way that reduces that burden? So I think things like having white lists of things that, you know, would be exempt that don't need more paperwork. Um, I think the U.S. uh, special validation passport system, which um, was introduced after the death of Otto Warmbier, where Americans needed a passport, a special passport every time they wanted to go to North Korea, was just so inefficient and so unfair to these humanitarian workers and people that had spent a lot of time engaging with North Korea now needed every time to be able to do this. And, and I, if I remember correctly, I think now they're changed to allow for multiple entry special validation passports, but no one's had the ability to profit off of that yet because of COVID. So I think some of these, you know, these, these measures really need to think about, well, what, what is the impact on humanitarian work? So I think that's one way. And I think the other way is funding. You know, a lot of the humanitarian country team appeals were severely underfunded. And I was quite shocked. I think this was in 2019, I want to say, because it was in the paper that was published in 2020, where I looked at the global funding appeals and looked at, well, so it says this is the, the country, this is the number of people we're aiming to target, and this is the amount of money we're asking for. And I'm now I'm I'm very qualitative in my work. I'm not not I'm not the best with numbers, but I was looking at it and I was like, wow, North Korea seems like it's pretty good bang for buck. Like you know the amount they're asking for and the number of people they're trying to reach seem really a different ratio than a lot of these other contexts. And so we did we actually divided. We said, well, how much are they asking per person? How much is the UN system or the the UN coordinated system asking per person? And in North Korea they were asking for $20 per person that they were trying to reach. The next lowest, um, which actually, if I remember correctly, was was Ukraine, was something around $68 per person. And I know it's not as simple. Like, yes, many things impact what the cost per person reached will be. So I know it's not just as simple. Oh, this is, yeah, there's a lot that goes into that. But still, I was like, wow, this is, as a donor, I'd be thinking, like, this is the best bang bang for buck. This is the most, you know, the most people I can reach with the smallest amount of money. But it's it, these programs are still not being funded. So I think even if all these structural things were to be addressed, um, even if North Korea opens the borders to humanitarians, even if all of those things change, without funding and without the ability to do work, the resources to do work they need to do, humanitarian organizations are still left in a position where they can't they can achieve what they could potentially do. And of course, when we use the term international community, that's a pretty shorthand umbrella term for a whole host of different actors with different interests 
And then within that ecosystem, the different kinds of humanitarian organisations that are in the field is varied and complex as well. Like if you were to describe that or map out that ecosystem of different humanitarian organisations that are working in North Korea, how would you chart it? How would you describe it? On the most base level, there's, and this is, again, talking pre-COVID, I think we'll see what things look like post-COVID, but there are the, the residential groups and the non-residential groups, and there's the NGOs and the IOs, the international organizations, UN bodies, things like that, and then the NGOs, and then those that have permanent offices and permanent presence in the DPRK, and those that don't have a permanent presence but would come in either regularly or, or ad hoc. But I think more deeply than that, there's many, many different kinds of organizations. So we have the kind of big international organizations, big international NGOs, you know, Doctors Without Borders, Save the Children, Concern, these, these massive organizations. And then there are these small purpose-built organizations that really focus on North Korea. And I think if people are interested in getting a firsthand account of one of those, I would recommend uh, Joy Yoon's book, Discovering Joy, who writes about her experiences living and working in North Korea, um, doing medical humanitarian work. There's actually lots of humanitarian workers that have written books about their time in North Korea that I find really interesting. I'm reading one now called From the Outside, no, From the Inside Looking In by Dwalta Rafneen, who worked for Concern, I believe. Um, so this is a perspective of someone working for a much larger NGO, um, but still their office in North Korea was quite small. So I think there, there's different types of organizations and there's different approaches that these organizations take. And there's different ways of, yeah, I think, I think this term ecosystem is, is really valuable um, because it isn't necessarily a ultra organized structured system, but I don't think it should be either. Again, talking about the way structures can, can inhibit. So there can be, I don't think the size of a group is relative to its impact. I think, you know, there can be groups that are really impactful, but still quite small. And then there's, I think, the faith-based organizations. Uh, and that's been really, really interesting for me to learn about as I've kind of gone through this journey of learning about North Korea and learning about these kind of transnational acts of care for North Koreans uh, and seeing the the faith-based element in that um, and the so, and, and it's not always binary, of course. It's not like, oh, you're faith-based or secular. Um, I think there's a lot of people working in secular NGOs that may have a faith-based personal pro personal motivation or people working in faith-based groups that they themselves actually maybe are not a person of faith, but have still a drive and, and compassion and belief in solidarity with North Koreans. So I think with many of these things, it's not always necessarily black and white, but I think those are some of the overarching kind of characteristics, I would say, of some of the different groups working. And, and I'll also say that I'm, I'm talking generally about international groups, um, meaning groups that are not from the Korean Peninsula. Future predictions have been the graveyard of North Korea scholars, as many found out in the 1990s predicting North Korea's collapse during the famine period. But that tendency has given way to scenario mapping, which I think is a much more useful thing to do. Now, you've done some work on this with Sarah Son and Daniel Chubb, who you spoke about earlier done work on transitional justice. So that's not just scenario mapping, but it's also making a case for justice-based transition pathways about what a post-Kim North Korea might look like. So what's the importance of this perspective? I'm really interested in this. Yeah. So I think first, this idea of scenario mapping is really, really valuable. I was allergic to making any anything even bordering on a prediction about North Korea because of reading some of this literature from the 90s that predicted collapse, that even if someone said like, you know, what do you think the weather will be like in North Korea tomorrow? But I won't comment on that. I'm not going to comment on that. But I think understanding scenario mapping a little bit better has helped me think about how to think about the future in a way that's not predictive. And I actually, if I can give a little plug, my workplace, the Center for Humanitarian Leadership, just released a free open course on scenario mapping. People are interested in learning how to do it themselves. So I think having, I had a colleague that worked in, in Foresight that really helped me think a little differently about thinking about the future and that future thinking does not equal predictive thinking, which I think I had a quite um, narrow view that it did, which was incorrect. So I think that's that's one thing. And I think with the transitional justice work, itself. We've been using the term 
lately in our, our conversations of anticipatory transitional justice, because there's no transition yet, right? And the goal of our work is not to say this is what transition will look like. That's not what we're trying to do. I think, you know, I'll be the first to admit I have no idea what the future will hold. But I don't think that element of the unknown is reason to say, oh, well, then we can't prepare for potential scenarios. And a lot of this project that we've been we've been doing, so this was funded by the Academy of Korean Studies, um, and the actual title of it is Transitional Justice in Korea, a Role for Australia, because we were curious about what may Australia be able to offer by way of support for a future transitional justice process or and or contemporary preparatory transitional justice work. I've never done transitional justice work before, so it's a big learning for me. And one thing that's really come out of this is, you know, a lot of the, the literature is around kind of globally, not about North Korea, globally on transitional justice is about the importance of grassroots initiatives. But in the case of North Korea, you know, A, the grassroots initiatives like this are not possible, and B, but there's no transition anyway. So, but I still find that thinking really valuable because if we understand transitional justice as something that needs to be fostered and created by the people who, the stakeholders who have experienced it, aka by North Koreans, well, what, do, what implications does that have right now for a country like Australia? And some of the things we've been talking, you know, if we're understanding this as, as grassroots and, and as bottom up, well, what impacts North Koreans' opportunities in Australia? And I'm thinking not only escapees, but even North Koreans that are in the country, you know, uh, is there pathways for engagement in study tours? For escapees, is there ability to come to Australia? Because as, uh, as you know, and maybe as, as many listeners will know, North Korean escapees to South Korea are then given South Korean passports and so don't have a claim to asylum in Australia um, because they're recognized as, as South Korean. And so we're, we're thinking around, you know, some of these, these structures around how Australia creates opportunity. And I don't think creates enough opportunity, but that's maybe another conversation. But, you know, so it has support for people from other countries who maybe come and study in Australia. Many people of North Korean origin that have escaped don't have the opportunity to do so because their South Korean passports then kind of make them ineligible for these programs that I think they should be eligible for. And so initially, you know, I, I had kind of thought about these things, but I didn't connect them to something like transitional justice. But then thinking about transitional justice as more grassroots and bottom up, that means many aspects of someone's life then impacts the way they understand transitional justice and the way they want to see transitional justice. So we're also thinking in terms of, well, what kind of, what kind of things can countries like Australia do? Um, we've also been keeping an eye on countries like Canada, who recently under, I think last, late last year, after lots of advocacy from the organization Han Voice now have a uh, North Korean refugee resettlement program, which I think is, is great, but it's, you know, community driven. So community fundraising, community, it's putting the, the onus of that on Canadians and, so thinking about transitional justice, I think, in a, because it's in this anticipatory, preparatory, but also challenging stage of not being able to have grassroots in the way we talk about grassroots in other countries, that's making us think about transitional justice in a much broader sense. So that's been really, really interesting work. We published one article from it. We've had um, this event and we're working on another article. And this has been a really really, really great collaboration with these colleagues. And I've learned a lot from it. Yeah. Yeah. I saw it when you put that paper out on Twitter, read the abstract and think we got to talk about this. <laughs> this looks good. Is there any connection between work that's been done on transitional justice in the climate change space? Is there any relationship there? I don't know, but I think that's something I'm going to have to look up. I'm going to have to learn about. Yeah. <laughs> Write it down. Because in this like anticipatory yeah. kind of nature. Yeah. Because trend, like that word transitional, transitional justice, from my understanding, you know, there needs to be a transition for there to be justice. But I think climate change is another example where what we're in the transition, we're constantly going to be experiencing this. Podcast interview bears immediate fruit. <laughs> <laughs> So you and I have joked many times that the North Korean studies community is a collection of weirdos. And we say that very lovingly because we're weirdos in this community too. 
But what is it about this group of people? What attracts people to this particular field? And it's a diverse group of people, so it's a diverse group of weirdos. But yeah, what is it about North Korean studies that's so interesting in this regard? So I, I think the first time I kind of used this term weirdos was in a very like unself-aware way when I was like, wow, everyone involved in this is a little weird, but not me, <laughs> not me. And then later being like, oh no, me too, me too. <laughs> and look, I don't think that's, I think the term weird in a very, as you say, kind of loving and respectful and kind of celebratory manner I think part of it is that academia is kind of weird, like to be so interested in something that you're going to spend several years on a PhD to just delve into it without really any prospects of job security afterward or any semblance of a well-balanced work-life balance in those years or in the years after, you know, it's, it's not a... I think it takes a certain type of personality to begin with to really want. And, and that's not to say other professions, you know, I think there's lots of professions where people can channel their passion. This is just the way it manifests in academia. So I think that's the starting point. And I think when it comes to North Korea, I think people have to be very creative. And that's one thing that I find so inspiring about a lot of work I read about North Korea is that the way people, again, you can't just fly to North Korea and do your field work. So people have to come up with different ways of trying to understand North Korea, different ways of trying to collect data and use that, use data in different ways to answer the questions they have. And so I think it also attracts a certain type of personality that wants that, that kind of problem solving and that creativity um, in that, you know, maybe to, to, to many of these people going off and, and flying somewhere and interviewing people freely just doesn't seem that as interesting as, you know, trawling through these documents online and trying to pull a picture out of those or so I, I think that balance of of creativity and of passion makes it a really interesting group and I think it's also very diverse and maybe not diverse I think it could be much more diverse in many ways um, both in terms of gender but also in terms of race and you know I think about a lot of the North Korea kind of specialists that we tend to listen to in Australia and in, in the U.S. and kind of in the West, whatever that means, um, that maybe they're Korean, maybe they're American, maybe they're European, but, you know, there's so many people from other parts of the world that have spent significant time in North Korea that have, are from countries that have, you know, deep diplomatic ties um, that I feel sometimes we don't or often don't listen to enough or hear from enough. And that's not because they don't have the expertise but I think sometimes the idea of, well, who is a specialist on North Korea can be, yeah, gendered and, and racial. Um, so when I say it's diverse, I, I don't, I think it could be much more diverse in many ways. But there is diversity of opinion. There's a diversity of understanding of what work is needed to be done to try to understand North Korea better. Or, or even that goal, you know, is the goal to understand North Korea better? Is the goal to understand how we, the international community, communities, I guess we can say, because it means many things, uh, interact with North Korea. So I, I think it's a really interesting group of people. It's a really interesting field. I am really looking forward to reading Jeffrey Robertson's work uh, on watching the North Korea watchers. I think the fact that someone is studying this group shows that it's not just us thinking like, oh, what's up with these people? What's up with this, this community that we're a part of? Um, and again, in a very loving and, and respectful way, this little uh, world of weirdos. Yeah, I'm very much looking forward to having a chat with him when his work's complete. Because uh, he wouldn't have started doing this work if there wasn't something inherently interesting about this correct collection of people. Exactly. Something that you and I have discussed several times is the issue of mental health in academia. How did we start talking about this? Yeah, how did we? Well, I think I had read about you before I met you, mm. um, and then I met you in Seoul, mm. and I was like, "Oh wait, that's the guy with the blog." But then, you know, that was when I thought I'd never see you again. And I was like, "Nice to meet you. <laughs> go enjoy your life in Australia, a place I will never visit or go to or have anything to do with." <laughs> Uh, one of the first times I think we talked about this was in relation to difficult review processes, which is 
most academics are no stranger to this. What do you see as some of the stress points in our line of work as academics? What are some of the things that have impacted you from a mental health standpoint? I think one of the things is this feeling almost of, of guilt, that there are so many smart people that do really great PhDs that have trouble finding a place within this really restrictive market. And so I think sometimes when I'm feeling stressed about work, I then have this impulse to think, well, but I have a job. Why am I complaining or why am I stressed about it? But I know that's not a healthy way to think about it. I think, uh, you know, the fact that the system is unfair and that many people that do brilliant work don't have a pathway into the into academia can be true at the same time that it can be a challenging uh, field to work in. You know, they're not mutually exclusive. Um, but yeah, I would be lying if I said I didn't sometimes feel that that guilt, uh, which then compounds sometimes the stress. <laughs> well, then I feel gu- then I feel guilty for feeling guilty, and I think because it is like I really value. We've talked a lot about research, but my teaching is also really important to me, and I think one of the big stress points is around you know do I feel that students are getting what they deserve and what they need to be able to learn. But also I can't be working 16 hour days every day to be able to deliver them what they need and what they, because what they need and what they deserve and the times that the university thinks that things should get done and can be very different. And so I think sometimes there's this, this stress of, you know, am I, am I providing to, like, am I giving students everything that I can give them, but within something that's reasonable for myself as well. And so I think that kind of aspect of of stewardship or of mentoring or of whatever you want to call it that that is a really fulfilling part of the work but it's also a challenging one when you know there's time frames for you know how long you're expected to take to mark a paper but in reality to give good feedback takes much longer than that um, than than the time frame you're given and then I think another stress is um because this is you know people talk about their successes you know actually you, you mentioned that you saw I posted about a paper I published on Twitter. What I don't post about on Twitter is, oh, you know, failed grant application or uh, this paper was a desk reject, thought the journal was perfect for it, but they didn't think so. So now I have to totally rethink, you know, what what conversation is this article having? And I, I do see some people that are more open about those things. Um, uh, I'll call out Aaron Clark Ginsburg, who uh, I love. He is a disaster researcher and he very transparently posts on Twitter like, number of grants applied for in the year, number of grants received, number rejected. But I think when you're constantly seeing the good, it can be really, it can kind of eat into your brain of, well, everyone else is publishing, everyone else is getting their success. And, you know, today I got a rejection or, or sometimes even worse is, well, today I feel like I didn't progress on anything. Like, what did I, in particular, we're talking about big, and this was something I found that I harken back to my PhD days was, you know, working on a big project and, at day by day, taking little pieces of it. But within actually working as an academic, you know, it's not that I have this one big project, you know, it's, it's research, it's teaching, it's service, but also recognizing, well, things don't get done. You know, it's not like a, a neat and tidy to us. You can just tick like, oh, well, I finished that. You know, things will take longer. And sometimes that gives for me the illusion that things are static. And so I have to be really conscious about recognizing what I've done in a day and celebrating that yes, I am making progress, even if it sometimes doesn't feel that way, or if you, it can be a very comparative field, right? Like we're like so many metrics are around, well, you know, what's the average for your field, but how, you know, how many, an average article, how many times does it get cited an average academic at your level? How much are they publishing? And so when you feel like you're not making that, or you feel like you're comparing so much with that, it can, I think, go into this loop of, well, I'm not doing enough. I'm not doing enough. And I hear this also from people that I look at them and I think, but you're the one I'm comparing myself to. And I feel like you've got it and I don't. But then hearing that they also have this mentality of, oh, I'm not doing enough. I'm not doing enough. And that is part of also why I hate working from home because I really like a separation between the space is very important to me and the space I work. If I work from home, I find it really easy to just spiral into this. Well, I need to do more and do more and just work much later than I would if I was in my office when I can say, well, I did my time for the day. This is all I'm going to get done today. And that's okay. Close my laptop and, and get on the tram and go home. 
but I, I think that can be really, because the work is never done. The work is never, ever done. And so I think that makes it really important to be really proactive about mental health because it's very easy, I think, in this field to feel unsatisfied and to feel constantly like you're not doing enough. Mm-hmm. And there's a really damaging cult of hard work that some academics perpetuate mm-hmm. that they're actually really into working 16 hour days and look down on other people that don't. It's like, you are not a role model for what a good academic should be. This is not healthy. Was there any stage as an early career academic where you thought that you had it, that you really belonged? Was there a moment that you can look back on? I mean, I think sometimes I have those feelings and then later I think, wow, I really had no idea. I was so naive. And, it, it, you know, this is some of this, what I was just talking about earlier. But I'll give in one example that really was very meaningful to me, which was that shortly after I moved to Melbourne, the Monash universities in Melbourne, but it felt really nice to be involved in that. And so I think that, and actually I'm going to be presenting at the um, the next one, or I guess the second mm. one after that uh, in a week. And it, I always, there's always a little kind of special place in my heart. For- there's one particular thing that you wanted to talk about on the podcast related to mental health, and that's a condition that you have called trichotillomania. Sure. So trichotillomania or trick, which Australians will love because it's a shortened version. Um, so trick is a condition that manifests in pulling hair out. For me, it's pulling out the hair on my head, um, but other people, it may manifest in things like their eyebrows or their eyelashes. And trick is uh, in a lot of literature connected to anxiety and also to kind of obsessive compulsive behaviors. And that's what really speaks to me is this obsessive compulsive part of it. I don't identify as much with the kind of anxiety side, although I know when I get stressed then it manifests even more strongly. But for me, it's obsessive. And it's something that I think sometimes if someone is, has never met anyone with trick and you hear, oh, you know, I, I pull my hair out and I can't stop. It's like, well, have you tried just not pulling your hair out? Um, which is sometimes the reaction I get from people. You know, oh, just don't do it. But because it is a, a compulsion for me and it is really something that happens sometimes without me realizing it, or even if I do realize it, I feel powerless to stop it. Unfortunately for me and for my line of work, it manifests a lot if I'm at a computer. So yeah, particularly in COVID, you know, sitting in front of my computer for hours, um, I just couldn't stop pulling my hair out. That's why I shaved my head. I shaved my head in April, 2020, um, because I found not for everyone, but for my trick, that physical getting rid of the hair really helps. So I maintain now um, a pretty closely shaved head. Um, It has a lot of implications on my posture though, because as my hair grows out, I find ways to pull it out that are often quite uncomfortable. You know, I'll be straining my neck here and there and I'll realize that my arm is aching. And so I think it's important. I wanted to talk about it because I think, A, to, you know, raise awareness of this condition, which is within a family of what are called BRFBs, body-focused repetitive behaviors. Um, And I think many people experience BRFBs without necessarily realizing it or perhaps have in their past. Um, If anyone was a nail biter as a kid, that is a form of BRFB. So, and I was a nail biter as a kid. So I see it as I kind of graduated. I don't bite my nails anymore. Um, I just obsessively pull my hair out. So I, 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 I don't, you know, I, I see that as kind of connected in, in my journey. It affects my work on a daily basis and it affects the way I move through the world. And I find a lot of inspiration from other people that have trick. And even knowing the name of it, for many years, I didn't know the name. I just was like, oh, I pull my hair and I can't stop. But even knowing a name felt so validating. I'm like, oh, you know, this isn't just something I shamefully do. This is like an actual condition. And so I felt a little freed from that, that this, I kind of had this belief that this was just something weird I did. But knowing that it was a condition helped me shed that stigma of weirdness and not this loving weirdness that I was talking about earlier, but I I felt this weirdness Mm -hmm. um, initially about it that was more like, well, I'm wrong, I'm weird and wrong. It's been really important for me to be a part of a trick community. And there are trick communities online, there are trick communities like in, in person or on, on Zoom. Yeah, I think when I think about my my work and my life, 
this is an important part of it. It's not a particularly glamorous part or a part that is, you know, when I publish a paper, I don't write in the acknowledgments. And I want to acknowledge like all of the hair that I pulled out that helped me write this paper, because otherwise I don't know if I would have been able to. But it is, I think, a part of of my journey and a part of, you know, a part of my work is also learning how to manage this and learning how can I, with all these stressors we talked about earlier in academia, how can I navigate those while knowing that I also have this compulsion that can make me physically uncomfortable, it can make me mentally uncomfortable, it can make me nervous to, you know, I get nervous if I think someone else has seen me doing it, if I'm in my office and I realize someone's knocking on the door and I realize that I'm pulling my hair out and I think, did they see me? Are they going to, you know, what impact like, is that going to have on our relationship? Are they going to notice? Maybe they don't care at all. So yeah, I think I just wanted to talk about this in case anyone else is listening that has trick or knows someone that has trick, because I think stigma is and unfortunately, that people carry a lot of stigma that have trick. I know I, I have, but in recent years, particularly since shaving my head, I've just been like, I've let go of a lot of that stigma because I now physically, visually carry my trick with me everywhere, um, which has helped me kind of come to terms with it and come to a little bit of peace with it. But yeah, that's that's a little bit about trick and my journey with it. Shaving your head, that must have been a really cathartic experience, I imagine, to fully own it and step into it and integrate it. Yeah, it was. It was pretty um, – I think I would have never done it without COVID. If I did it in April 2020 when I thought, well, at the time I thought, you know, I'll be at home for eight weeks. <laughs> um, if, if I'm ever going to do it, this is the time. You know, if I hate it, I can – order a wig online and no one will ever have to know for a few days until the wig comes in. I'll just keep my zoom camera off. So I really thought, you know, if I, if I don't do this now, I'll never do it. And actually my, my husband shaved my head uh, and I shaved his head as well. He doesn't have trick, but he was like, I want to get in on this. Um, and so it was, it was very cathartic. It was very, um, I felt like a badass, like taking charge that's for so long trick had controlled me that I was now controlling trick. But I also want to be very clear that for some people shaving does not help that their trick can then move to another part of the body or, you know, it doesn't. So I caution against celebrating it as, you know, this is a pathway for everyone that has trick because like with many conditions, it's, it's, it's never one size fits all. But for me and for my experience, it was really, really valuable. And um, I'm very grateful to have tried it. And I'm grateful that people tell me that my head hair looks better shaved. I have like a fade. I you know this is, auditory so I have like a fade and a little hair on the top um and many people have no idea that it has anything to do with trick they just think I like wanted a cool haircut and so I also feel grateful that people have had that kind of response and that I don't really get I get sometimes questions about it but I don't get questions of like oh aren't you waiting for your hair to grow out or can't you you know you should grow your hair out actually I had a friend kind of intervene and say you should never grow your hair out again you look so much better (laughs) (laughs) um so yeah that's that's it was it was very cathartic for me. Mm-hmm. But there, there's such power in confronting the stigma and shame, mm-hmm. and to stepping into that vulnerable space. So thank you so much for talking about that and disclosing on here. This is what what the Edge Dwellers Cafe is all about. Nazneen, thank you so much for joining us at the Edge Dwellers Cafe. Thank you for having me. Edge Dwellers Cafe. Bravo, Nazanin, for an awesome conversation. One of the many slices of my professional pie includes teaching into the Master of International Development program at the Trobe University. So in this program, I've got the privilege of teaching students who either work in or aspire to careers in the international humanitarian sector. So for those of you listening who are training to work in this area, Nazanin's sagely advice about critically unpacking the savior impulse, localization, and the research practice nexus are well worth taking on board. And much respect to Nazanin for her willingness to talk about mental health and her journey with Trick. That's how you own it, Edge Dwellers style. A quick reminder that you can support the Edge Dwellers Cafe podcast by clicking like and subscribe on your chosen podcast platform and or by sending a dollar or two on Ko-Fi to help me cover the costs of releasing the EDC into cyberspace. 
Your support is the fuel that powers the Edge Dwellers Cafe project, and it's always much appreciated. That's a wrap. I'm Ben Habib, and this is the Edge Dwellers Cafe podcast. Much love.